Though I hold these words for you deep inside of my heart, I hope they will reach you someday. Welcome back to the one and only, because no one else cares, Shuffle Retrospective. Episode 23, Character Analysis, Asa. If Primula forms the show's core and that her story and character journey mirror that of all the questions the other characters strands each ask us as the viewer, then Asa Shigure makes up the other half of that point. She is the show's answer to its own questions. When we look at Asa as a character, we have to understand what the point of her is, as it deviates from the others. Where they're all used to propose faults in the genre's formula and archetypes, Asa is used to illustrate a less toxic route to true life. She is imperfect by any means, which is quite important. She can be rash, tomboyish, but she's deeply caring and has an old head on her shoulders, as it were. Her playful, almost sundry aspects act as a front for her more muddly interior and a deep routed sense of shame and regret for her past actions as a child, which in turn continue to plague her in the present day. However, all this is Asa's issues are initially external, where Sia, Narane and Kaide all have a hand in their own miseries. Asa doesn't. She didn't ask to be born ill. Mind you, we will see soon that she isn't infallible to the same traps the other girls fall in. But the point to focus on is, especially early on, Asa kind of has it together. This fallibility plays heavily into what the point of Asa is, realistically. We can see this part of her portrayed all over the series. I mentioned before a great visual reference to it in episode 18, when we see her and Rin bantering, while an alternative young couple do the generic formulaic asking out scene in the background of our focused foreground. We also mentioned how in that same episode, when Asa is neglected, she doesn't swoon and look wistful, but instead she pouts. And when it reaches a boiling point, she doesn't make excuses for Rin or blame herself like some of the other girls might have, but instead slaps him and gives him a good what for lecture. In fact, our very first scene of discussion was one where we saw how much she contrasts Narine in her apparel and cooking style, along with her sisterly tendencies to carry plasters around. And that was all the way back at the start of the essay. Even when they do finally get together, their relationship differs heavily from that of Rin with the others. They date, kiss, and talk in a casual manner. They act like old best friends, because that's what they are. A good couple is one where both parties aren't just in love, but rather one where they enjoy each other's company feel comfortable in their intimacy and can act naturally. When Rin is with Sia, Narane and Kikyoko, he has to keep putting up a front, as they do. Both parties have to actively try to impress one another to make things perfect, to make them how it's supposed to be. And when he's around Kaide and Primula, he has to act in the traditional image of what he perceives a man of the house to be, all playing back into his character team of societal and cultural male expectations. But with Asa, he and she genuinely look happy together. Like they're having a whole lot of fun just talking or going to cafes or doing the shopping. A large part of Asa's later character is this relationship. And it's a healthy one built on mutual trust and a slow burn of bonding across the whole series run. The aspect of realism goes further. I earlier referred to Asa as keep spoiling the plot. And that can now take on an entendre meaning, as not only does she audibly spoil elements of the story when she explains that you don't control who you fall in love with, that it's more special than that, but also is an active agent against the harem formula. To elaborate, Asa is used to discount the tropes of her story in exchange for submitting a better way forward. It's her who convinces and supports Rin in rescuing Primula, rather than just having him work it out by himself. It's her who we think will be going, or is going to be the Vart Yandere, um, victim when Kaide loses control, but instead because the one to par- instead becomes the one to partially save Kaide, with just her words and hug and helps largely pull in pulling her back into the light. But as mentioned, this realism is a double-edged sword because in real life, even if you are pragmatic, caring, and an un- ultimately kind individual, a good person, if you will, life isn't fair, and Asa becomes very ill. Fallibility. As we discuss episode 23 in the first half of 24, we'll experience how Asa being a real person can lead to its own form of hardships. The episode cleverly opens on a reminder of where Rin is and who he is, rather than on Asa. This will soon be used to draw parallels between his past self and his current self. 
he lashes out at a doctor seemingly in charge of treating Arthur after the closing events of 22. His intentions are in the right place, but his actions prove extremely selfish as he puts Arma in a position of having to support both him and her daughter, when she herself is already under some great considerable strain. Remember this, it will be important. We at long last get a full account of the details involving Asa and Arma's respective backstories. The details aren't overly important by themselves, as they were guessable, but nonetheless is a good source of intrigue. What actually stands out most in this scene is the brilliant directing on the display. The special effects used for the explosion really sell you on the idea that this was a truly catastrophic event, and the general directing of the flashback with its vague, dreary and dreamlike allusions to Asa's father, Arma's saviour, are visually most welcome. With this information, we better understand the nature of Arthur's illness, as we can link it straight back to what we already knew about Primulus. However, it also brings to light a new question. Primula simply needed to mature as a person in order to better control her powers, but as Asa is already a fleshed-out individual, her issue comes from the fact she refuses to use said powers. In what is a truly brilliant masterstroke of an idea, the show actually turns the concept of the young heroine being the most realistic love interest into the central plot point. Asa's ambition to be, in her own words, I'm a human, human just a human, a human are her hang-up. The episode has some other noteworthy points, father. slightly less tangentially to her personal story. There's a nice short scene with Kaide, Primula, and Kareha come to visit, it being these three is a good combination, considering two of them are Asa's best friends, and the third is essentially Asa's cousin. The scene is also great for Rin, as Kareha, along with Ama in another scene, asks Rin to think about what it is that only he can do. Imperatively, though, she doesn't tell him or so much as give him a hint as to what that is, only that she's relying on him. It's so important that this is the case and it continues to put the owners on Rin to make the decision that he believes is right. As you can imagine from my summary description alone, the conflict of, the, the conflict of this final arc revolves around Rin and Asa arguing over her hesitance to use her powers. We get a number of beautifully slow dialogue scenes of Rin spending time with Asa, who the animation team do a great job of gradually making look more and more decrepit, her face turning ever more pale to the point it's almost bony and malnourished. To me this is a wonderfully alternative extreme to the yandere faces that Kaide made earlier on. And like that one, this one too absolutely haunts my dreams. Asa's being what you might call selfishly altruistic. It's a team every character shares, and a general team of the show, and while Asa manages to keep away from it for a time, we now see it finally catch up to her. Her conflict is in a way the most realistic part. Its solution is simple, just use the magic. But like is so often true in life, it's not that simple. It's funny that on occasion throughout this essay I've referred how people far too often fail to see past themselves, can have their minds narrowed by a certain sense of thinking. In Asa we're seeing this, she isn't doing this out of malice, she isn't trying to hurt Rin or Ama, she's doing what she believes is right. Grasping why Asa won't just use her magic can be really difficult, but if you've experienced people who act like this in the real world, then you can totally understand what the story is trying to say here in this particular element. Rin growing ever more desperate placates her, borderline begging her to act before it's too late. But Asa retort is frustratingly blunt. It's my, it's my life, life to bet, not, not yours. Have you ever heard someone say something to that effect? These episodes make a brilliant job of showing us Rin's anguish. He mopes around the hospital corridors and waiting rooms, which reflect his own isolation in their barren emptiness. I find a genuinely heartbreaking scene when Asa describes her dream, one where an aged version of herself and Rin stand upon the same overlook and once more profess their feelings for one another, all while the camera stops upon a disconcerting top-down view of an empty, dusk-baited overlook. The words don't match the image of the path she's chosen to tread. Finally, we get the last piece of the puzzle, as Asa explains her motives, stating she doesn't That's want to use her magic in an magic. effort not to hurt I'm her mother human, any further than she already did as a child. A the voice child. acting here by Monica Rial, animation are crushing, as your heartstrings get snapped in half. Mother. Aside from playing into the themes of her character and that of the show, like again, it's also just a live. wonderful case of irony. Her actions mirror Rin so closely. Remember that scene at the episode's open? She believes wholeheartedly that what she's doing is for the best, but in reality, she's the one making her mother responsible for her own daughter's death. To loop it back around to an earlier point, were you to compare this to modern politics, it's like those who saddle their high horse in order to defend some group or minority who never actually asked for such aid. Asa has decided on what's best for her and her mother without talking all the facts, or without taking all the facts into consideration. 
She hasn't asked Arma what she wants. And that's a running thing. Rin doesn't ask Primula what she wants, etc. With that, we come to the end of episode 23. And with it, we can now truly understand what Asa Shigure is. Her and Rin initially seem like an old-fashioned, the opposites attract type co- couple. The introvert and the extrovert. The reliable best friend and the decisive young boy. But in reality, they share more in common than we expect. They've both got unfounded expectations on their shoulders, both have been through a traumatic upbringing, and they are each a kind-hearted to an absolutely detrimental fault. That's part of what makes them such a great couple to each other, along with what we already discussed above. In a way, Asa's character is much simpler to talk of than the others, as her role within the narrative as a more realistic waifu means that she dispenses with much of the baggage, and that what she does have mirrors the other characters, hence we've already discussed it. As I have no intention of repeating myself, considering the absurd length of this essay already, I shan't go off on another ramble about the themes of finding your personal identity when you're only a young person, or on another rant about the topic of extreme altruism, but please don't take any of that to mean that I value Asa as a character any less than I do the other five primary forces of the show. No, indeed, her portrayal is one of the things that I believe makes Shuffle work so well. Not content just to criticise, it gives us a more healthy, vague guideline to contemplate and think about with its take on the ideal healthy relationship, and then it snatches it away with what has to be one of the most realistic depictions of how crap life can be even when you're in love. Illness or accidents, differences in opinions or unforeseen circumstances of previous actions can all jump from nowhere to ruin everything. It's a really harsh lesson, but that's one one that's important to teach, especially to a young otaku audience, and definitely if it has a happy ending. Us as a character represents reality, represents the fallibility of us, and the importance of always getting back up on our feet no matter what life throws at us. It's about holding on to the people you love, and realising when what you're doing is hurting them the most, not helping. She's about facing reality with a head held high. Episode 24, and what is important. With all that we've just discussed and have been in general about Rin and Asa's safety kept in mind, we now find ourselves on our way to the final episode. Shuffle's finale is a favourite of mine in a medium that will, while sometimes struggles to finish satisfactory, definitely presents some stiff conversations. If you'll allow me to gush for just a moment, I love how in the end of episode 23, after a whole 20 minutes of defying anime conventions, it at last stops and tells you that it's okay to want a happy ending. That sometimes things do work out, and you can be a hero for someone that you care about. I love how masterfully it wraps up all the loose ends. How it's not afraid to be cheesy and add in a moment the odd moment of levity. How it doesn't wholesale reject the traits that make us fall in love with these genres in the first place. Let's get a little ahead of myself. I love how it's a happy ending. Heck, if nothing else, I love how ten minutes of it act as an epilogue. Now why aren't those legally compulsory? Well, I'm unsure if it's my favourite ending of all time. Gurren Lagann, Kogi, SF&AB, Revias, the original Madoka Magica, Full Metal Panic, the TV version of Ava are all incredibly generic guesses for what some of my top three would probably be. I'm confident it will place in the top ten, probably right around where War in the Pocket is, were I ever to sit down and feel them. With all that said, we should probably take a proper look at what we're dealing with. We start things ahead, and off the bat we have some interesting framing. Asa has got up and left the hospital, Rin is in hot pursuit, and his friend desperately searching the building for her. The presentation takes wonderful strides to dull the colours of these scenes, while also making sure to once more make use of perspective, to draw Rin as small as it is noticeable. The rooms are all empty of other people, which all adds to put an emphasis not only on Rin's hunt, but also to make him look even smaller and adds to the growing sense of desperation. There is a scene with other people, uh, and I mean a scene, that acts as one of the many examples of Shuffle's brilliant compliance to basic writing tenets. Rather than Rin saying or monologuing something to convey his thoughts, he instead rounds a corner to what appears to be the A&E department. A trolley sound surrounded by emergency staff parades down the hallway, in, with the focus being on Rin's expression. The short couple of seconds seamlessly communicates what he's thinking, and the deepest worries which he's feeling in this moment, without a single piece of explanatory or worthless dialogue being spoken. We get some shots of Asa's journey into space here and there. One in particular depicts her falling in front of a rubbish collection point. The lingering shot is her sandwich between a discarded can in the foreground and piles of other miscellaneous rubbish bags in the background. 
The piece of imagery feels dark, chilling almost. And I've always referred it one of two ways. On the one hand, it seems to be almost a homage to similar subteams in the likes of Ghost in the Shell, where the idea of a corpse of a human being comparable to garbage is a side focus of that film's amazing art direction. However, it could also be seen as a representation for Asa, Amar and all the test subjects who are failed experiments doomed to die at the hands of their own extraordinary abilities and potential. Conversely, it could just be as heartbreaking as it is eye-catching and nothing more. The rest of the city is portrayed in much the same manner as the hospital, with only a collection of uncaring machines in the form of car traffic for company. Rin and his quests seem ever smaller when framed on these sullen backgrounds. He retreats to the familiar setting of the park, and while sitting on the fountain side considers his options. This small, tiny moment is it. This is somewhere. the combination of his art Where? and I absolutely love the subtlety. It's here he decides his course of action, and here where he finally has to Think think about her. Not about himself, or what would be socially right to do, which in the moment would probably be to call the police or armor or anyone. But instead he thinks about Asa, and Asa alone, deciding what he thinks is best for her, himself and no one else. Now we come to it. This one of this one is the last big scene we need to discuss in the whole show's run. I referenced it earlier, all the way back in episode 20, which for me writing this was some weeks ago, and for me recording this was fucking ages ago. This scene is my final favourite scene TM, and I want to preface it one last time, reiterating that I am no way qualified in any form of media study. Indeed, I'm a rank amateur in all manner of analysis regarding of the form of media and apparently talking straight. And as such, I doubt my words can truly do this scene any real justice. Therefore, if it's a while since you last watch Shuffle, I advise you going back and rewatching at least this scene, up to the break title card, or just a whole episode if you want. Heck, fucking rewatch the whole thing, it's worth it. To properly reacquaint yourself with the tone and feeling of this scene. You done? Okay. After reuniting with a forlorn Asa, Rin listens calmly to her for a time. No music plays, which I love, and Rin is mostly silent to boot, as Asa, with a hollow smile, utters her devotion for the young man. There's some nice parallels to the other scenes here. Rin gives Asa his jacket, the only other case of this being criminal in episode 15. Furthermore, his eyes are obscured throughout most of the scene as he hides his true intentions, his mind already made up. I really like that you know me really as well like as you do, Rin. Asa's well face is continually drawn in that same unnerving, ghostly fashion from the prior episode adding further to the sickly sweet feel of the scene. The camera grows legs and proceeds to track much of the shots. In particular is how Asa closes the distance between herself and Rin. However, the following shots hold as Rin steps away, replacing the closeness with a new distance. The two continue their chat, their usual banter still shining true to give this tragedy some minor moments of levity. Your heart breaks some as Asa continues still to ramble onwards. Hey, come on. Don't shortchange it. If all you can say is I guess, then it makes the confession seem like nothing. It touched me, so please don't ruin it. I... I'm sorry. I am glad that you said it, though. In fact, I'm really glad that you said it just like a proper gentleman would. As Rin increases the aforementioned distance between the two, you soon realize then what he's doing isn't what he's been told. That would be to l that would be to let her die like she asked. Nor does he leave it to Asa's mum to talk her out of this crazed course of action, which, remember, is what happens in all the other arcs. Instead, he does what he wants. He decides to save her no matter what it takes. The music at last cuts back in, but it isn't for a dramatic rescue this time. No, that was episode 15. Instead, it's much more intimate. So much smaller and yet a way bigger act in its own fashion. It's surprisingly graphic as Rin slits his wrist and presents a kind expression to his blood-stained face, while Asa all the while despairs at the scene unfolding in front of her. Personally speaking, I'm quite squeamish. In fact, just talking about this vague summary with the episode in the background makes me somewhat embarrassingly a little light-headed. It's why there's a gaping hole in my knowledge of gory horror anime. <laughs> Regardless of that, I think it's fair to say this scene shows another glimpse of the production team's fantastic breadth of skills, as the blood is in no way obscure, hammering home the severity of the scene, but also imploring its importance. This small act has its desired effect, an episode 24 and 24 episodes in, and Rin finally becomes the hero of the story. It's a redemption arc, in a sense. I've already said at Tedium how in each of the other arcs someone else plays a large part in saving the girls, Likaris for Primula and Narane, Kikyo for Sia, Primula and Asa for Kaide, and while in each story Rin does take an important role, I love how in the end he does the truly heroic act in order to save the one he loves. 
in a sense, it's cheesy, sure. A little too romantic for sure, no, for some, no doubt. But the camera swooshes out as Oscar's powers envelop the screen and the story draws to a close. The advertisement section ends and we resume where we began some approximate 540 minutes worth of screen time later in the hallway of the Furio residence. The art style has changed once more, now being slightly more detailed and even moving at a higher frame rate in places, which sure makes for a nice touch to make it seem more flush and fluid moving. The final section of this show is its epilogue, but that doesn't mean we're done talking. No, indeed, there's some clever stuff going on here. Firstly, I suggest that we have a mirror to scene one and episode one. However, Primula's pigtails swing into the frame, cueing us in that this is no recap. She also narrates this final segment, as mentioned in my analysis of her character earlier on. This epilogue is so satisfying because it takes time, as we will see, to show us each character's continued development. Primula herself helpfully clues us in that only around three weeks have passed, ergo the characters are definitely still working on themselves, but enough time for most of them that we can enjoy the catharsis of seeing how they've grown. Primarily on that list is Kaide. She's put all her more dangerous tendencies into the role of being an older sister. However, unlike with Rin, Primula is someone who has a younger sister rather than a surrogate daughter, is someone who she can rely on who, to support her rather than how it was with Rin. Kaide was simply catering to his desires. This new setup is a marked improvement for both as they act as good sisters should and help each other. This scene continues to repeat the same joke from the opening episode, with Kaide forgetting her own lunch, though Primula's inclusion here obviously changes the scene intrinsically. A new one-off track plays over the moment, and Primula conveys the aforementioned information about the passing of three weeks, as well as confirming her age as just one year below Kaide's. We follow up with a scene reminiscent of episode 22, we with the girls on their way to school, before making for a nice grouping even before we're in an office's entrance, and Primula continues narration, proceeds to spell out the plot for anyone who's still not paying attention. She says this as a response to the news that the gang were thoroughly pissed at Rin for risking his life, which is an expected and fairly justified thing to hear. As stated, we get something akin to 22 in these last 10 minutes, essentially fan service. However, what I've always found interesting about it is how it's less fantasiful than 22's effort. Where it had made outfits, lewd Kikyoko and drunk dads, 24 is far more low-key. It's much more grounded, more realistic. The people involved act like a group of friends who've been through a ton of traumatic events in recent months. Sure, there's still the girls fawning over Rin, but it's far less etchy. Furthermore, rather than a party, they simply return to the rooftop get-togethers. It's also playful in a really uplifting way. For example, the visual novel character cut-ins return, not for the first time, but they always make themselves absent in the more serious parts of the story. Except this time the borders spring to life, bouncing off one another and covering over each other as the characters talk over one another. It's a nice touch and pretty darn wholesome. We get to see Iski receive a genuine rejection from each of the girls, which is both brutal and hilarious for how straight it's played. It's then followed by one last aversion, as I think it's fair to say most of us expected Mayumi and Iski to finally become an item, but instead, despite a compliment about her face, we get one more glorious beatdown of everyone's favourite resident gutter-dwelling pervert. Bam in the dirt's gun, as I've written in my notes. There's some more great comedy beats as during said roof's top lunch, Primula breaks nonchalantly. Uh, sorry, during the proof top lunch break, Primula nonchalantly assassinates Rin with her cooking and pretends like it wasn't her elaborate plan all along while grinning Machiavellianly all the while. It should also be noted that Naranay is absent from this scene, a further usage of the show's adherence to its own rules, and a good way to display her continued development past the confines of the group, which we'll touch on a little more in a second. Following that, we have a couple more important narrative points left to mention, as the show seemingly ties up its remaining loose ends. Like most of Shuffle, it's simply action. Uh, sorry, like most of Shuffle, it's a simple action. We watch as Arma walks down the street covering herself with full confidence as she strides mm. past the two other world, the kings. As they pass, they mumble to one another about a woman they once knew and how they only wish that now they could apologize for what happened. Arma turns and bows. That's it. This to me is how all loose ends should be tied up. By like lore or something. So the composition is quite nice here too. It's set too. in what the film Your it's Name called Golden Hour or Dusk to be less romantic. As such, the sun covers the all too familiar high streets in a warm glow, while in a sense being a visual metaphor for the compromise between light and dark. Rather fitting for the best friend duo of God and Demon. 
We get one or two instances of plot-based fan service next. We're also presented in a fritty servers outfit at the cafe where Karaha works, as alluded to literally two dozen episodes ago. Her and Rin share one last set of cute dialogues, showing how all is one small well in the world, and in what I believe is Karaha's little sister's second appearance and only line in the show, she sums up the smile these final scenes always put on my face with a brush of her own. I love that happy ending. And then it ends. We get some great custom credits, which are always a win in my book, including an exceptionally well-animated kiss between Kaide and Sia, that being the other instance of fan service, and wrap up the last bit of development for Narane. We learn earlier in the episode that she's really taking to her new pursuit of radio, and may even be going to sing on air in the near future. Like the armor ending, this is such a perfect illustration of masterfully writing an ending. After all, not only is she clearly living life for herself and enjoying it at that, but the point about singing is definitive proof that she's come to terms with the death of her sister, and has truly recovered from her survivor's guilt. Her shot in the credits shows her at Lee Kreese's grave. It's both nice, as she's the only character incapable of being present in the epilogue, but also another sign of Narane's progression. Prior to episode 15, I'm strongly confident she could never have faced that grave, but now she looks on it as her own person. It's also nice how it ends Shin's theory that no one would grin, grieve the artificial lice proved false, as evidenced by this shot of Narane at the gravesite. Neither the show ever forgot or Narane, their big sister, which plays quite well into the team of family. It's just a nice way to wrap things up. Long sought after conclusion. Well then, here we are, some 42 plus thousand words later. I've no intentions to do the whole sappy, this show changed my life spiel. However, I suppose some context is appropriate in the final act. Shuffle was not my first anime, but one of a series of recommendations from a good friend, meaning it was certainly something I watched in the first year of proper anime viewing. You know that year when you realise anime is more than just Digimon or Yu-Gi-Oh and Pokemon? I loved it on that first watch, and it probably set my standards for harem and rom -com anime way too high. If you see my mail list, you'll know I actually score most generic harems in the region of a 7. Read on judging anime by jury for more information on that. But for one to get a 10, this is the standard I expect. Coming up with a summary here is tricky. We've gone through a lot, and Shuffle as a show has so many dense layers that I once more must insist that I have hardly done it justice. However, as I said at the very beginning, I've always struggled to find any good analysis for more niche shows like this one. Sure, there is some, but much of it is shallow or people complaining that they don't like how Asa is the winner or they hate how Rin is a pussy, which brings us back to what we discussed in the Maturity and Nudity segment. If someone has done a better analysis, please send it on to me as I'd love to hear the thoughts of other reasonable people. But in lieu of that, let's wrap up, shall we? I've watched Shuffle more than five times now, and an inordinate number of time has been spent thinking about it, so much so that between that and this essay you could probably add an extra couple of watches onto it. Ever since that first rewatch five years ago, I've been threatening friends and my long-suffering brother that I would actually write something about it one day. But you might still ask why, though how you got down this far would baffle me. Shuffle, for me, is the epitome of what makes anime unique. It appears to an audience of young adults and teenagers that the West so often wants to forget exists and refuses point-blank to cater to with any sincerity. It's a visual wonder with its ocean of metaphors, literary shorthand and show-not-tell storytelling. Combined with its frequent abusing of the art style to a fascinating extent, the OST is varied and versatile, although the version I have of it on YouTube is missing a lot of the tracks, so fuck you YouTube. It embodies the somber yet springly spirit of those visual novel soundtracks we've all come to love. The story is slow and considered, it, well, shuffles from genre to genre, with ample amounts of foreshadowing, logical decisions, natural, relatable drama, and a real sense of that anime heart that so many others often look down upon shows uh, exude. I've heard people use the term Gynex spirit to refer to Studio Gynex and Trigger shows, and I can think of an alternative form of that that shines through the visual novel shows of the 2000s. An honest sincerity to which they speak to their audience with. A kindness that isn't afraid to critique when needed, but is ultimately made by those people with a passion for this unique form of storytelling. I love that Shuffle is never cruel, but instead pragmatic about its characters. It doesn't try to pretend their illness, mental or otherwise, are some good romantic thing. It doesn't approve of de detrimental altruism that so many wish fulfillment stories make light of. But it also takes great care to humanise these troubles. To remind its audience that it's okay not to be okay. 
Its messages about genre tropes and fantasy metaphors for real-world issues seem more relevant nowadays than they did 15 years ago, with a foresight one could compare to Anno's own predictions towards otaku culture back in 95's Evangelion. Speaking of which, I refer to Shuffle as the Ava of the rom-com harem genre, and I stand by that. Not quite a deconstruction, not quite a condemnation, but instead filled with teens of surprising hope and the chance of continued retribution. Not so much a subversion, but rather a show that does deconstru- or that does its trapping so well that it ends up exposing their inherent flaws. This isn't a show about condemning escapism, but instead one about reminding you that sometimes you have to wake up from the dream in order to reach an even better reality. And what better a message could you possibly try to deliver to an audience of young people in a world as painful as ours than that? As much as I'd long for it to be, this is by no means a comprehensive analysis. There really is just so much more up to this silly, light-hearted anime from 2005. But I hope in these rambling pages and videos, you've come to see just why I love Shuffle, and why it is, I think, such a crime that it's an anime that was forgotten by the general community. In an, era, in an era of anime where each season some new show comes along to fix the genre, whether it be the recent likes of Mishaka Tensei for Isekai, Rent a Girlfriend for Harems, or Haramiya for Romance, this isn't to say I have an issue with any of those shows in particular. I think everyone would do well to look back on what came first. The age of a one series complete show with concise and emotional storytelling that exceeds in every department may be over as every new series intends to on dragging their stories out into multi-seasoned, incomplete, set-to-half stories, but that doesn't mean we don't have the luxury of being able to go back to the golden age. In this age of ultimate availability, we can choose to watch whatever we want at any time. Sure, there is plenty of new properties still coming out, but maybe it's time you stop trend chasing. Don't watch shows that you don't enjoy just so you can hate on them, but equally do give all shows a fair shot and good fate. Like Shuffle, dispense with the rhetoric. Form your own opinions, but be flexible within them. Be tolerant and open to change. Try to understand everyone, no matter how deplorable they may seem to you. If a Japanese cartoon about cute high school girls can do it, then surely so can you. I sincerely hope you got something from this lesson, and maybe Shuffle even raised in your estimation a little after it. If you got down to this video, you have my extreme and wholehearted thanks for watching. And I honestly really hope you enjoy. Best regards, Norman.